Let us read Matthew chapter 27, and we will read verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Let's look at verse 57. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Joseph of Arimathea was the one, after witnessing the brutality and the torture and the affliction of our Lord Jesus Christ, to offer a place for Jesus to rest his own body. What stirred his heart to do so, I'm very sure, was because he witnessed the death, the brutal death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you know from the Word of God and from the passages that we read, there is no mention of Joseph of Arimathea throughout that whole ordeal when Jesus Christ was whipped, when he was gushed with the crown of thorns, when he was crucified naked on the cross. He has, throughout that whole time, not been mentioned. But I'm very sure that in spite of the things that we don't know what he did during that time of the crucifixion, and also things that we don't know about what he did during the time that Jesus was alive and throughout his whole three and a half years of ministry, that particular incident at the cross of Calvary stirred upon his heart where he would come out and where we would hear a good deed of what he has done for the Lord Jesus Christ and that is giving him a place to stay. That is very significant after witnessing the brutal death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He couldn't leave him hanging. He couldn't leave him hanging on the cross. Something stirred upon his heart after witnessing all of that, after that whole time where he was silent, where there's not much mention about what he did for the Savior, that whole ordeal on the cross of Calvary was what finally stirred his heart. I can't leave him hanging there. The vultures will eat him. Uh, the Jews, they know that when bodies are left hanging, that it's a curse from God. And I refuse to leave him hanging there. All this time, I haven't done really anything for him, but finally I can do at least this. Give him a place. I can finally give him a place. My question to you is, maybe you're one of those who haven't done much for the Lord and your deeds are not much mentioned. 
But the least you can do is give him a place. Can you give him a place after all that he's done for you at the cross of Calvary? Or are you going to leave him hanging there? Are you going to leave him hanging on that cross? After all, Jesus died for our sins, and our sins are the reason that put him on the cross of Calvary. So even though right now you may not be crucifying him on the cross, the Bible did say in Isaiah 53, surely he had borne our griefs. That's what the Bible said when he was crucified on the cross. He carried our griefs. Why, the grief that Jesus had to bear on the cross of Calvary, can he still feel the grief of our sins today when the Bible said about the Lord today, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. See, you can leave him hanging on a cross, so to speak. You may not be physically doing so, but the same griefs that Jesus suffered on the cross of Calvary can carry as just as much weight because it's the grief of our sins with your sins that you afflict upon him today. 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 That can present tense put him through the same experience of grief that he recalled, that he felt on the cross of Calvary. So will you leave him hanging on a tree then? Will you leave him hanging on a cross and grieve him? Or will you finally be like Joseph? I can't leave him hanging there. I finally give you a place, Jesus, in my life. I can finally put you to rest. You don't have to stay up there. I would like to challenge you to do that. Will you pray with me? Father God, fill within me the power of the Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. I pray that today's preaching will touch and change people's lives as we observe your supper. Bless the whole ordeal and the process. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would like to say when we look at Matthew chapter 27... That Joseph did not just give Jesus a place to stay, a place to rest. No, Joseph did much more than that. After witnessing the cross of Calvary, after witnessing what his Savior had gone through, he had to do more than that. In verse 57, the Bible says, When the even was come, there came, notice, a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph who also himself was Jesus' disciple. You'll notice right here at verse 60, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. He did not just give him a place to rest. After witnessing the brutality of the crucifixion, no, he had to do more than that. He had to give him a rich place, a new place, Something that he gave his very best and put his very best into. That's the kind of place that he gave for Jesus to stay. He didn't just put him at any normal burial site or just simply gave him a place to stay. No, no, after witnessing the crucifixion, he did so much more than that. My question to you is, do you give Jesus a place to stay? You might say, yes, I put him as a part of my life. He is very important to me. But my next question to you is, do you richly give him a place to stay? Do you renew yourself, a new place for him where he can dwell in richly? After all, the Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you, dwell in you, dwell in you richly. After all, the Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are, what? Sealed unto the day of redemption. You see, Jesus Christ is sealed within you. Yeah, you gave him a place. Like Joseph, gave him a place. And the Bible says that the tomb was sealed. Jesus Christ resided in a sealed place just like 
how He's residing in a sealed place in our lives. But see, Joseph made sure that Jesus was going to dwell there richly. That Jesus Christ will finally have a place to rest comfortably. And it would be a new place. It would constantly be renewed. However, in our lives, I don't think we really practice that in renewing ourselves so that Jesus Christ can dwell richly in our lives. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves that. You know why it's that important to do so? Don't just give Jesus a place because you might cause Him more grief than comfort, than rest, if all you're going to give Him is a place to dwell rather than a place to dwell richly. You might say, why do you insist that, Pastor? Because the Bible says, let's go back to that verse in Ephesians 4.30, grieve, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, meaning that He can be grieved. In the context of what? Not just, listen, hanging on the cross. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed. You know what that verse means? As Christ is sealed within you, while He's living in your sealed place, you can still grieve Him. So you may not be leaving Him hanging on a cross, you might have the conviction that, Lord, I don't want to leave you hanging there. Let me put you as a part of my life. But I can't give you everything of myself richly to dwell in. I can't do that. That's a little bit too much. I mean, I came to church. Isn't that enough, Father? I read your word here and there. Isn't that enough, Father? I'm a King James Bible-believing dispensationalist. Isn't that enough, Father? Father, I forsook some things in my family, forsook some things in my life. Isn't that enough, Father? No, don't just give him a place to dwell. Give him all. Give him richly. Because some of those things that you keep to yourselves, those dirty things, those things that you refuse to let go, are residing with Jesus Christ. And, that, and he is sealed within you to the day of redemption. And you don't want him to live within you uncomfortably and grieve throughout that whole time until the rapture. If your sins grieve Jesus on the cross of Calvary, your sins, get this now, just as much grieve him as he is living in your sealed place. See, you don't have to leave him hanging on a cross. You can give him a part of your life, give him a place in your heart. But there are some things there that you refuse to let go to give Jesus a place. And what that's going to do is that's going to grieve God. After all, didn't the Bible say in Revelation chapter 3 that God said, I would that you were cold or hot? Right. But if you're just spiritual and combine that with some of the things, fleshly things, sins or things you refuse to surrender to God in your life, or worldly things and desires in your life, if those things are clung on to God, combined with your spiritual, God said, that makes me sick, and I want to spew it out of my mouth. The Bible says that the book of Timothy, to be rich in good works. You know why it's important to be rich in good works? So that he don't be grieved within you. Uh, is he dwelling you richly? Is he dwelling within you richly? Or is he dwelling within you with grief? Go to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Let's look at this case of Joseph Arimathea again. He provides Jesus Christ not just a rich place to dwell in, but he craved, you will notice, he craved for Jesus Christ to dwell in his place. If you'll notice in Mark chapter 15 and verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved, craved the body of Jesus. 
Why would he have such a strong craving? Modern Bible translations will say that that's a, maybe a false friend, as some false prophets say, right? <laughs> they will say that it's, a, mis, it's a, a poor translation. It simply means just desire or asking or beseeching. But I like crave better because, one, it is a correct translation. Crave shows a strong desire, a strong plea. But even more so, the craving can fit well with our understanding of a strong desire. See, to say that Joseph simply had a desire is not enough. He had a strong, a very strong desire that he would ask for the body of Jesus to be buried in his place. The Bible says he craved. I wonder what would make him crave the body of Jesus. Why would he strongly desire that? Throughout that whole time, Joseph was not mentioned in the Bible of what he's done for Jesus Christ. During that whole time while Jesus was suffering and dying, there is no mention of what Joseph did. So you can imagine all he did was just, as Matthew 27 said, sitting down, they watched him there. He had to see his Lord and Savior being crucified, crying out in pain. And those were sins and griefs put upon him. And can you imagine as he's looking at Jesus' face with a crown of thorns on his head and his beard plucked out and then blood pouring out, tears coming up in his eyes because he was forsaken by the Father when he never experienced throughout all of eternity being forsaken by the Father. For he was one with him. And then seeing his back torn and then those spikes pierced on his hands and his feet. And he's already torn to shreds and he's already bleeding and dying and Jesus Christ suffered so much already. And Joseph did nothing that whole time. Nothing. Nothing. All you could do is just watch him helplessly. And then finally, when Jesus died, something just stirred within Joseph's heart. It's like a light bulb began to flash in his head, and as soon as Jesus gave up the ghost, Joseph was, had some sort of awakening and realized, I need to take action here. I need to do something. Like a strong craving came within himself, and he's like, I want the body of Jesus. I want to do something for him. I want to give him a place to rest. We may not understand or know the real answer to why that strong desire came all of a sudden, all of a sudden after Jesus Christ died. But perhaps we can know from the previous verse at verse 42. 42. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, comma, that's why Joseph of Arimathea went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. What was it something about the Sabbath, the preparation, that would make him boldly come to Pilate and crave for the body of Jesus? Because it was known throughout that time that the Jews realized when bodies were hanged on trees that according to the Old Testament law, that was a curse. And because the Sabbath was coming, they don't want to leave a curse on the tree and they would take those bodies down. But, but know that the Jews here, they loathed Jesus Christ. They didn't love him. They didn't care for him. They wanted him crucified. And the terrible thing about the crucifixion is not just suffering it while you're alive, but the horrible process continues after you die. That dead body, while it's hanging on the cross, what happens is the vultures come down and they take opportunity to eat up that body and tear his flesh. And dogs even, stray dogs would come down and then eat the bottom parts of the body and then try to eat whatever remains. And all you'll see is a lifeless torn, shredded, maimed corpse on the cross. And that can happen as soon as life is gone. 
Don't you know that during the crucifixion, some of those vultures and some of those fowls of the air can take opportunity to bite some parts of the flesh? But once that body loses the willpower and the strength to fight off those fowls, those fouled creatures, then it's open season. And have you seen birds of prey waiting, just waiting for you to finish up something, for you to stop fighting them, and they're flying overhead and waiting to just consume whatever food you left over or whatever food you left on the ground, or as soon as you're gone and you stop the power and the strength to shoo them away? You ever seen them do that? Maybe that's why Joseph of Arimathea, when he sees those fowls coming down on Jesus, flying overhead, and those dogs, they are panting and waiting to eat up whatever remains of his body, he couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, no one was going to take down the body, body. No one had the reputation, the status, or the power, or the, or the riches to do something like that except him. So it was like a dawn breaking forth and it was like an awakening call for him. And throughout that whole time he did nothing and because of the urgency of the Sabbath coming where he wouldn't be able to take the body down, the urgency where those birds of prey and those wicked creatures can eat up and tear up the body of the Lord Jesus, he, you can imagine him. He had a strong desire like any drug addict that understands the urgency of time. That I need it now. I need it now. And Joseph of Arimathea had that craving. I need it now. I need to give Jesus Christ a place now. Not tomorrow. Not later. Not when I hear the next sermon that will convict me. Not at the next moment of witnessing my Lord being crucified and dying for me. No, no, now, because whatever remains or left of Jesus Christ, I may not have it the next time I say, okay, I now give you a place, Jesus. Because those demonic creatures who are assimilated with fowls of the air, they just ate up whatever is left of the body of Jesus Christ. You want a craving? to give Jesus Christ a place in your life, then understand the urgency that you would be addicted, that you would run for it, because there may not be much, listen, there might not be much of Jesus Christ left for you to give a place. Now, do I, do I believe that we have all of Jesus Christ in us and we are complete in Him? Absolutely right. In the sense of salvation, but what about your relationship? Not much left. What about your walk with Jesus Christ? Not much left. And listen, this might be more serious, maybe even more so, the filling power of the Spirit. Not much left. Why? Because those birds of prey have taken it away. It's called, one example, your flesh. Hasn't your flesh lived so many years of what it's doing as a foul creature eating up everything in your life that it's very difficult now to give Jesus Christ a place? Yeah. Not much left to give Jesus Christ, huh? Has work consumed you to the point and busyness has consumed you to a point where you skipped out so many things in church and Bible reading and prayer that there's not much left of Jesus Christ to go back to. It's just too hard. Some of you consider it a chore to even read one chapter of the Bible. Okay. Why? Not much strength in you, not much of Jesus Christ left or in your relationship that you can grab. Have you ever prayed and prayed so long, so long, and God never answered? Maybe because there's not much left. Not much left and God knows I need to wait longer because you waited on me too long too. So you can wait on me. And not much of God in your life, not much of answered prayer moving in in your life because those birds of prey, right? You already ate too much of that. You don't walk out of the service addicted realizing the urgency of giving Jesus Christ your place. And the reason why is 
because too many of those birds of prey and those dogs have eaten it up. There's not much left. Let's go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Another case of Joseph of Arimathea giving Jesus Christ a place to be buried after the crucifixion. Luke chapter 23, the Bible says in verse 50, verse 50, <coughs> And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. You notice that he is capable of begging for the body of Jesus and giving Jesus Christ a place to stay because notice the verse says he's not like those other Jews who would leave him, who would leave him hanging on a cross, who were wicked, evil, that they were so demon-possessed to say his blood be on us and our children. We have no king but Caesar. They would prefer a murderer over their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They wanted him dead. They wanted to leave him hanging on a cross. That's wicked. That's evil. But what made Joseph different? The Bible says he was a good man. The Bible says he was a good man because he consented not to the death of the Savior. I would like to, I would like for you to think if Joseph was not a good man then. If Joseph did consent with those Jews about the death of the Savior, would he give Jesus Christ a place to stay after that? No, he wouldn't. So after Jesus Christ is brutally tortured, think about it, brutally tortured, gushed with a crown of thorns, beard plucked out, that would move any heart of any individual to repent, to give Jesus Christ anything and everything, and say, Lord, my life is yours. Here's a place for you to reside. You would think after the crucifixion and a beating like that, that would move any heart to give Jesus Christ a place to stay. But isn't it unfathomable that as Jesus Christ was hanging there on that tree for hours, tortured, bleeding, and torn, not one heart of those Jews was moved. Not one heart of those Jews were moved and they just left him hanging. They didn't care. It didn't convict them. It didn't move their hearts. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because they consented to his death. Because they were not good, they were evil. You wonder why the death of Jesus Christ doesn't stir or move your heart. You ever wonder why you don't give Jesus Christ a place to stay in spite of the Lord's Supper that you've taken numerous times to observe how much He loved and died for you? Because you must not be good people then. Good people would be moved, but you must not be that good. And every time Jesus Christ is whipped, every time Jesus Christ is crucified, and every time Jesus Christ was tortured and afflicted for you, it just goes one year out the other like those Jews. You must not be good people. But good people get moved by that. Good people come on the altar again and repent. Good people, even if they keep sinning or messing up, they still try to get right. They still try. But if you've been losing that, then you've been losing the goodness in your heart. And the Bible gives the reason why. He was a good man because he consented not unto the death of Christ. What made those Jews evil then is that they consented. You know why you lost conviction over the death of Christ? You consented. To those Jews in your life that kept torturing him, afflicting him, grieving him. Don't you know that even not just sins, 
but things that are not sinful, you consented to, that afflicted him, that left him hanging on the cross, where you refused to give him a place in your life because of things that were not sinful, that you consented to. You know what you consented to? You consented to excuses. Excuses are very powerful to consent to. And in spite of Jesus dying for you and saying, all this I did for thee, what hast thou done for me? You still won't let that convict you or move you, stir you up to give up your excuses and give him a place to stay because you consented to excuses. You know what's very strong and powerful? This is maybe a guess, but perhaps what made those Jews so mad, so mad that they would flagrantly not be moved by the death of Christ, maybe, just maybe, could there be bitterness? Could there be bitterness? Because their expectations were not met of a coming king and bringing in the kingdom? Could it be because of deception? Their religious leaders that they look up to deceive them, and that's why they consented to his death? <laughs> you know why your heart ain't moved by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you consented, perhaps, to bitterness. Because you consented to deception from spiritual figures that you look up to. And as long as you consent to those things, the death of Christ will not move your heart. Bitterness combined with deception is a strong, potent poison. And no matter what Jesus Christ does for you, you will not be moved. Because you consented to that. You know what consent means? To give in. You can't give in to those things. But I would like to take it up a step further. Consent, I would like to say, is not just giving in, but giving up. Giving up. Because when you give in to something, you can repent. You can plead the blood of Christ. You can get back. But if you give up, you made your choice. You drew the line. And you don't have to give in when you give up, see? When you give up, you gave place everything that the devil could want to control your life. And then his madness possessed your mind. And then when Jesus Christ is crying out in affliction and in pain, and after all he's done for you and he asked you to do something for him, he asked you for a place to reside in, that don't move your heart. We sing too many hymns about it. Pastor Kim preached too much about it. People keep testifying, I thank God for my salvation, what Jesus did for me on the cross. But you heard that too much, it don't move your heart anymore because you consented to bitterness and deception from spiritual things and figures. When you combine those things, you'll never be moved. But if you don't consent, then see... What's going to happen is you'll still give Jesus Christ a place to stay. You'll give it to him. You ever wondered why the death of Christ didn't really move your heart? You consented to your way too many times, don't you think so? That's the bottom line. <coughs> John 19, please. John chapter 19. I would like to conclude here what Joseph went through that helped him that we can discover and learn from in giving Jesus Christ a place to stay. One important thing, let's look at the account of John now. We've looked at Matthew's account. We looked at Mark's account. Now let's, we've observed Luke's account, and now we will look at John's account. John 19, 38. <coughs> and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. The other gospel accounts did not mention this, except John. 
What we know from the other gospel accounts, Joseph did a good thing, right? Gave him a rich place to stay. He craved for the body of Jesus. And he was a good man. He did not consent to his death. But there was one weakness that was not mentioned about Joseph. His weakness was, which explains why he was silent the whole time at the crucifixion, which explains why he was silent the whole time Jesus was alive in his ministry doing miracles, is that he kept everything in secret because he feared the Jews. That's why Joseph of Arimathea was not much of a disciple for Jesus Christ because he kept everything in secret. He kept all of these things in secret because he was afraid of the Jews. You know what he should have done? He shouldn't have kept it in secret. He should have let it all out. He should have let Jesus help him out with the problem. He should have been like those disciples, giving Jesus Christ a place in their lives, giving Christ a place in their hearts, and where Jesus Christ can give them boldness and help them out. But Joseph could not go that far. He kept everything in his life for Jesus Christ as a secret because of fear. Kept it all in. Can you imagine how frustrated he was as he saw those Jews mocking him? Torturing Jesus and crucifying on a cross. Can you imagine keeping that all bottled up in secret? Pretending like nothing's wrong, that he's a disciple of Jesus Christ and everything's okay, but he sees all that, he couldn't take it anymore. Don't you think so? That must have been frustrating. You know, the reason why you don't serve Jesus Christ as well as you should, disciple, is because I think your problem is... The things that you fear, you keep it all a secret. Joseph should have exposed his fear, confronted his fear, and that way he don't have to live his life in secret. But instead, he kept all of his fears and everything that he served God a secret. And that's how he lived his whole time as a disciple. And that is very frustrating as you keep witnessing Jesus Christ being afflicted for you. I think we Christians, we all reach to a point where we think everything's okay and we pretend that we're a disciple of Jesus Christ and just keep everything a secret. But you have fears in your heart that hinder you from your service to God, that the devil has taken advantage of to control you. Amen. And not just the devil, but the world and more so your flesh. Right. You know what you need to do with those things? If you pretend, see, that everything is hunky-dory, that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, and pretend those fears don't exist and keep everything a secret, it sure is frustrating every time you witness and you see and you hear about Jesus Christ being tortured for you, suffering for you, giving all of himself for you, and it just frustrates the tar out of you that you can't do anything for him. And you just keep all of that bottled up in secret, pretending, listen, listen to me, pretending that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, keeping it all a secret as you come down on the altar. And then pretend that you have a changed life. Pretend that you got right with God. But you know what a lot of people do when they come publicly on the altar? They still have something secret in their, their hearts of those fears and those problems that they did not yet surrender to God on the altar. And those things are kept a secret as you walk back to your seat. And those things are kept a secret that you haven't surrendered to the Lord or prayed to Him. You didn't seek counsel on. You didn't seek help on. You didn't study and confront those fears. No, you pre pretend. You put all those things as a secret and just live moseying about every day in your life because you got a job, you got your life, and you got your own way of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And those fears are swimming in your mind and in your heart, but let's pretend they don't exist. Keep all those things a secret, and let's just keep serving God as a disciple. Disciple. That's how you're living. And endless blowout preachings and endless sermons can be preached about how much Jesus bled and died for you, but that 
must be sure frustrating every time you sit through a service like that, don't you think so? That sure must be frustrating sitting through a service like that about Jesus Christ bleeding and dying for you and you should do more for him. And then in your heart, you got that secret fear. And you refuse to expose it to God and have it surrendered and treated and you just say, no, it'll die with me. And that's how I'll live my life as a disciple of Jesus. That's why people get frustrated during preaching. Do you understand? Because it is frustrating. You keep all these things secret. No one knows and you don't confront it publicly, even yourself. You keep it a secret to yourself too, don't you know that? You don't think about it. You don't want to contemplate on it. You don't want it brought up. You just pretend it's hiding in somewhere in the deepest depths of the corner, dark corners of your heart and pretend that it will always just hide away in secret. It won't come out. You don't think the devil, the flesh, the world is going to take advantage of that one day? You don't think God knows about that and will one day put that to a trial and a test out in the open? You know what the best thing to do is, Joseph? I think you're frustrated enough, don't you think so, keeping it all bottled up and in secret? I think after witnessing all that, Joseph, he could not take it anymore. And the Bible says that being a secret disciple of Jesus, because he feared the Jews, he confronted his fear by saying, hey, I want it exposed. I don't fear those Jews. I want the body of Jesus. They're going to know that I put him in that new tomb. They're all going to see that. Actually, uh, my uh, Jewish religious peers, they're all discussing about how we can prevent him from resurrecting and they want to put a guard over it. But I could care less. I want the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll say it in front of Pilate. I'll say it in front of those Roman soldiers. I'll say it where everyone is going to spread that news. I could care less. I want my fear to be exposed, confronted, because all I want is to give Jesus a place to stay. His fear was confronted by giving Jesus a place to stay. The fear cannot be confronted by you. Do you understand? That's why you keep it a secret. Fear is confronted when you give Jesus a place to stay. And when you do that, that fear is exposed. And Jesus Christ shows you some things that you need to work on, things that he can help you. As you come before him in prayer and give him that place to stay, Christ can finally work in you. And that frustration can heal. And those secret fears that you had will finally be accepted. And you'll finally be able to do new things with your life that you didn't dare to do and God will help you. But if you keep that all a secret, disciple, they'll keep frustrating the tar out of you and it'll kill you one day. You know what will heal that? You know what will help you confront that fear? You know what power can overcome it? Is only Jesus Christ. And if you would only give him a place on that, Lord, will you come in? This is what it is. I expose it out in the open, God. Here it is. I want you. I want you to come here. Here's my place that I give you to stay. And will you help me confront that? Will you heal that? Will you finally work in me? You want to confront those secrets? Are you tired of living that frustrated life? I don't know what sin you're struggling with. I don't know what bitterness you're going through. And I don't know what weakness in your personality or in your flesh you've got. And I don't know what worldly thing in this life, whether it be your health, your job, or family, that keeps controlling you. And then you pretend those things don't exist. You keep them all a secret and you just live your life as a disciple. That sure must frustrate the tar out of you all the time when the word of God is preached unto you, when the crucifixion is preached unto you. I think it's about time, Joseph, after being frustrated with all that, confused with that conflict, that you finally get it out in the open 
by giving Jesus a place to stay. But the question is, will you give it to him? He is not going to live in your place until you give it to him. The Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I will come in. He ain't going to come in and heal you or help you if you won't let him in. Every head bow and every eye shut. Now, you can choose to live your life in secret again after this preaching as a disciple, but you'll always live conflicted, confused, contradicted, bitter, angry, and hurt. Oh, immensely hurt. It's time to expose those fears, have them confronted by giving Jesus a place to stay. This time, give it to him. See, we cannot leave him hanging on that cross. It's time that we let him in and give him a renewed place, a place to richly reside in so that he don't have to stay in grieved. Do you want him stay in your place grieved as much as he was grieved hanging on that cross? You want to remind him of that? You want him to experience that again? Oh, that's why it's so urgent to give him a place to stay. Especially if there's not much of Christ left. <laughs> not much of Christ left in your life that he can work with. That you can restore the relationship. Where you can be filled with the Spirit. Not much left because you let those vultures and dogs... Keep eating, eating, eating away. Oh, it's so urgent now that, oh God, I come before you. I'm so addicted. I'm so addicted. Uh, uh, this is so urgent to me. I need you to stay in my place. I need you complete and intact in my life so you can give me a complete and intact life to serve you. But I fear, I fear that this preaching has not reached you. That the cries of the Holy Spirit being grieved as much as Jesus Christ was grieved on the cross, that's not reaching you. Because you consented too much. You consented too much to that flesh of yours. To the world. To your goals. To your ambitions to your own decisions in life, to the excuses that you've constantly abided by. You've consented too much to that, and that's why this preaching is not reaching your heart. Oh, how frustrated you must feel then, how frustrated you must feel from this preaching, talking about how Jesus suffered for you, how much he loved you. That must really frustrate you, how much you're not serving him because you bottled it up now for years and you've constantly lived your life as a disciple putting all those things in secret hiding it away and not confronting your fears and let's just be honest give Jesus Christ a, pla a place to stay and tell him here's my fear God it's that I fear people it's that I fear my own fleshly weaknesses I fear pain God I fear pain. I fear to lose this precious thing in my life. It's time that you confront it. Don't live in secret anymore. And don't go back to your seat after this altar call with some things that you'll take to the grave with you. And it'll be, remain a secret. No, give it to the Savior. Give Him a place to work with, to speak to you, to show you things that you must give up, to, sh to heal and to minister. Because that's the only power, that's the only healer, that's the only comforter that you're going to receive.
Give him a place to stay. Please don't give your flesh anymore a place to stay. Don't give your desires anymore a place to stay. Uh, don't give your worldly ambitions and lofty goals and dreams a place to stay. Don't give the devil a place to stay because the Bible says he can. It says neither give place to the devil. Father God, thank you so much for the preaching of your word and help us to observe your supper. Help us to give you a place to stay as we commemorate and witness and think about your suffering. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, the piano player will remain and uh, the rest of you, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It is important to understand what the Lord's Supper is, why we practice it. Simply, as people will know, we do this to remember how he bled and died for us. That's why the preaching was given at the beginning. We want to properly remember how much he bled and died for us. It's to do it in remembrance of him. And what we do is the Lord's Supper not only reminds us of his first coming when he died, but his second coming when he will rule and reign. That's why the Bible says that we keep this in remembrance until he comes. You'll notice right here that the word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26, 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. See, so it's his first coming of his death and his second coming when he rules and reigns. The bread is unleavened bread, which represents no sin and no false doctrine. And when it's broken and we eat it, it pictures his body being broken. You'll notice in verse 24, the middle it says, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The cup that uh, we drink the grape juice from, it pictures his blood. And it's grape juice. The Bible says in verse 25, This cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now notice right here that it is symbolic. It is metaphorical and maybe even spiritual. It is not literal. It is not fleshly. It is not physical. Where the unleavened bread is literally eating his body or drinking the grape juice is literally drinking his blood. You'll notice right here that when he takes that unleavened bread at verse 24, he's saying that's in remembrance of him. Verse 25, you drink the juice from the cup, it's in remembrance of him. So it's to picture his death. You'll notice verse 26, it's to show the Lord's death. See, so it is a picture. Now, the verse says in verse 27 that it is damnation and unworthily guilty of the body and blood of the Lord if we eat the unleavened bread and drink the grape juice unworthily. You'll notice that at verse 29 as well. Damnation you're drinking. Now, people get confused. They think that means going to hell. Uh, but that's not what it means. Damnation simply means condemnation. It simply means judgment. By the way, if you uh, look at uh, verse 31 through 32, the Context showed you it is judgment. So when you are punishing or judging someone, that word also means to damn them. See? So damnation is not limited to hellfire. Damnation is simple. It just means punish. So what is that verse saying? If you take it unworthily, see, if there are some things remaining that you didn't surrender to God, that uh, you didn't surrender to the Lord, then it's, you're going to face punishment from God. So what are those leftover things? Leftover things that you refuse to surrender to Him, right? Leftover sins that you didn't confess under the blood of Jesus Christ. Leftover duties. This is why uh, in this church, every Bible-believing church is different, but particularly in this church, uh, we believe that you should have been water baptized beforehand, and the reason why is because water baptism is a basic duty every believer ought to be doing. So we have to make sure that all things, uh, we don't leave unfinished things. That way we can partake it worthily. Jesus Christ even said in Matthew 3 when he received the water baptism, it's to fulfill all righteousness. 
See, so it's to fulfill the worthiness, the righteousness. So that's the reason why if you have been saved in the Lord Jesus Christ and baptized afterwards and baptism by immersion, afterwards, not before you got saved, but after, then that is why we want to say the third thing is to confess your sins to the Lord right now and that way you can partake in the Lord's Supper. This is why we had an altar call earlier so that you can properly confess your sins and whatever leftover things remained in your life. So you notice we are not the Catholic Mass here. We are not like the Eucharist or the Catholic ritual. We are a scriptural ritual and ordinance. This is one of the two ordinances of God, and we don't follow the Catholic Church where they think this is the literal body blood of Jesus Christ and you go to hell if you don't partake in it properly. We don't believe in that. We're very different from the Catholic Church in that sense. So what I would like to do is for some of you who have not properly confessed your sins to give you this time and opportunity. If you already confessed your sins on the altar, then just take a moment of silence, please. Just take a moment of silence uh, in honor and respect of the Lord's Supper. So will you please do that for about a minute? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son. And as we partake in this Lord's Supper, will you put your hand of blessing throughout the whole ordeal that um, will draw even closer to you through this and that we'll have something settled and we'll never forget, Lord, we'll never forget what you did for us. It is the greatest act of love you did for us. This is why we're going to keep practicing it until you come. Bless the remaining ordeal as we observe this for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I would like to ask our two ushers that I've called upon to do the Lord's Supper, if you can come forward, please. The Bible says that we are to give thanks uh, for the unleavened bread and for the grape juice. Basically, we are giving thanks for the broken body and the blood that he shed on the cross. So each of our usher, as I ask them to pray over a certain item that they'll Make sure to give thanks to the Lord for that one and ask for God's blessing upon it. So, Brother Robert, will you ask uh, God's blessing upon the unleavened bread and also to properly give thanks for him on that? My dear Father, we just want to thank the Lord for giving your son, Lord, and giving his body, Lord, to be broken for us, God, that he bore all of our sins and all of our iniquity, all of our grief, our sorrow, all of the things in that flesh that you gave him, Lord. He came in like Lord, that we never sin, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, you help us, Lord, to just take this seriously, Lord, and give you all the love for it, Lord. We thank you so much, God, that we get to do this, Lord. And Amen. Stir up our hearts and minds, Lord, to remember this, God. God, I think of, I think of your son being whipped, Lord, and as the, the whip dug into him and chunks of his flesh were flung out, Lord, I think of that as I, as I hold these these crackers, Lord, but it, it stirs my mind, Lord, to remember well, how much pain went through for me to be mm -hmm. able to do this, Lord, and to remember these things, God. God, I pray, Lord, that you help us to stick in our minds, Lord, that we use this, Lord, to, to fight against sin, to strive against sin, even under blood, God, that we fight harder and, and more mightily, Lord, for you, God, by remembering this thing that you've done for us, Lord, and I pray, God, that you bless it, that you bless each and every one of us, Lord, as we uh, partake in the Lord's Supper today, God, that you'd be well pleased with our desire, Father, to, to eat this cracker here, Lord, and to remember what your son did on the cross of Calvary, and even leading up to that with this scourging, Lord, and all of the things you went through, Lord. We just thank you so much, God. Amen. You're so good to us, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for suffering through all that you did. We love you, Lord. Pray you come back soon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
The Bible says about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head the accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This, is, this do in remembrance of me. You may now eat the unleavened bread which pictures the body of our Lord. I would like to ask Brother Britton to ask for God's blessing upon the new wine that we're going to drink and to properly give thanks to him for the blood he shed on Calvary. Yes. The Bible says some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and 
filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28 through 29, 27 through 29, And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth, of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You may now all drink the new wine that pictures the blood of our Lord. I would like to ask the ushers to collect the cups and then the rest of you, if you can take out your blue hymnals, please, and please stand. Please take out your blue hymnals and please stand. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, And when they had sung on him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Notice that the verse said that as soon as they drank the new wine. I would like to do the same as well, where Jesus and the disciples drank the new wine and immediately they sang a hymn. I would like to remember him that way and practice the way Jesus Christ pra practiced. Turn to page 276, 276 in your blue hymnals, please. Your blue hymnals, page 276. Here we go. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Verse 4, and when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died, my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. Father God, thank you so much for the broken body and the blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary. Thank you so much that we can keep this in remembrance, which helps us give victory in our own everyday lives, which helps us stay away from the wicked things of this world, which reminds us of your love, how much you loved us. And Lord, we sure need your love every day, but we need to remind ourselves of that so that it will help us to stay, to keep ourselves in the love of God. Now will you bless the remaining time that we spend together. May you be pleased and glorified by what we said and what we've done in remembering and performing the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Do me a favor. Say hi to someone you didn't say hi to. Please fellowship with.